Well, yesterday when you learned about streams, how worried to you about, about the order of evaluation and delayed arguments to procedures? The way we played with streams yesterday, <clears throat> it was the responsibility of the caller and the callee to both agree that an argument was delayed and the call, a call E must force the argument if it needs the answer. So there had to be a lot of handshaking between the designer of a procedure and the user of it over, over delayedness. That turns out, of course, to be a fairly bad thing. It works all right with streams. But as a general thing, what you want is an, uh, is a, an idea to have a locus, a decision, a design decision in general, to have a place where it's made explicitly and notated in a clear way. And so it's not a very good idea to have to have an agreement between the person who writes a procedure and the person who, who calls it about such details as maybe the arguments of evaluation, the order of evaluation, although that's not so bad. I mean, we have uh, other such agreements like the input's a number. Okay? But it would be nice if only one of these guys could take responsibility completely. Now, this is not a new idea. Al Goal 60 had two different ways of calling a procedure. The arguments could be passed by name or by value. And what that meant was that a name argument was delayed. That when you pass an argument by name, that its value would only be, be obtained if you accessed that, that, that argument. So what I'd like to do now is show you, first of all, a little bit about, again, we're going to make a modification to a language. In this case, we're going to add a feature. We're going to add the feature of by name parameters, if you will, or delayed parameters. Because, in fact, the default in, in our Lisp system is by the value of a pointer. A pointer is copied, but the data structure it points at is not. What I'd like to, in fact, show you is, a, is how you add name arguments as well. Now, again, why would we need such a thing? Well, supposing we wanted to invent certain kinds of, of what otherwise would be special forms, reserved words, but I'd rather not take up reserved words. I want procedures that could do things like if. If is special, or cond, or whatever it is, it's the same thing. It's special in that it determines whether or not to evaluate the consequent or the alternative based on well, the value of the predicate part of an expression. So value, taking the value of one thing determines whether or not to do something else. Whereas all the procedures like plus evaluate, and the ones we can define right now, evaluate all of their arguments before, before application. So for example, supposing I wish to be able to define something like the reverse of if, in terms of if, call it unless. a predicate, a consequent, and an alternative. And what I'd like to sort of be able to do is say, oh, I'll do it in terms of cond. Cond, <clears throat> if not the predicate, then take the consequent. Otherwise, take the alternative. Now, what I'd like this to mean is supposing I do something like this. I'd like this unless, say, if equals 1, 0, then the answer is 2. Otherwise, the quotient of 1 and 0. Okay. What I'd like that to mean is the result of substituting equal 1, 0, and 2 and the quotient of 1, 0 for P, C, and A. I'd like that to mean, and this is funny, I'd like it to transform into or mean cond <clears throat> not equal 1, 0. Then the result 
is 2. Otherwise, I want it to be the quotient of 1 and 0. Now you know that if I were to type this in a lisp, I'd get a 2. There's no problem with that. Okay. However, if I were to type this at the lisp, because all of the arguments are evaluated before I start, then I'm going to get an error out of this. So that if the substitutions work at all, of course, I would get the right answer. But here's a case where I get the wrong, I don't, the substitutions don't work. Okay, I get the wrong, I don't get the wrong answer, I get no answer. I get an error. Now, however, I'd like to be able to make my definition so that this kind of thing works. What I want to do is say something special about C and A. I want them to be delayed automatically. I don't want them to be, I don't want them to be evaluated at the time I call. So I'm going to make a declaration, and then I'm going to see how to implement such a declaration. But again, I want you to say to yourself, oh, this is an interesting kludge he's adding in here. A kludge, you know, the piles of kludges make a big complicated mess. Right? And is this going to foul up something else that may uh, occur? First of all, is it syntact syntactically unambiguous? Well, it will be syntactically unambiguous with what we've seen so far. But what I'm going to do may, in fact, cause trouble. It may be that the thing I add will conflict with type declarations I might want to add in the future for giving some system, some compiler or something, the ability to optimize given the types are known. Okay? Or it might conflict with other types of declarations I might want to make about the, the formal parameters. So I'm not making a general mechanism here where I can add declarations. And I would like to be able to do that. But I don't want to talk about that right now. <clears throat> so here I'm going to do, I'm going to build a kludge. <clears throat> so we're going to define unless of a predicate, and I'm going to call these by name, the consequent, and name the alternative. Ha. Ha. I got caught in the corner. If not P, then the result is C, else that's what I'd like. Where I can explicitly declare certain of the parameters to be delayed, to be computed later. <clears throat> now this is actually a very complicated modification to an interpreter rather than a simple one. The ones you saw before, dynamic binding, or adding uh, indefinite argument procedures is relatively simple. But this one changes a basic strategy. The problem here is that our interpreter does, it, as written, evaluates a combination by evaluating the procedure, the operator producing the procedure, and evaluating the operands producing the arguments and then doing an apply of the procedure to the, to the arguments. However, here, I don't want to evaluate the, argument, the, operand, the operands to produce the arguments until after I've examined the procedure to see what the procedure's declarations look like. So let's look at that. Here we have a changed evaluator. I'm starting with the simple lexical evaluator, not dynamic. But we're going to have to do something sort of similar in some ways. Because of the fact that if I delay a procedure, I'm sorry, delay an argument to a procedure, I'm going to have to attach an environment to it. Remember how HAL implemented delay. HAL implemented delay as being a procedure of no arguments, which does some expression. That's what delay of the expression is, of that expression. This turned into something like this. 
Now, however, if I evaluate a lambda expression, I have to capture the environment. The reason why is because there are, per, there are variables in there whose meanings I wish to der uh, derive from the context where this was written. So that's why a lambda does the job. It's the right thing. And such that forcing of, an, of, a, of a delayed expression was the same thing as calling that with no arguments. That's just the opposite of this. Producing an environment of the call which is, in fact, the environment where this was defined with an extra frame in it that's empty. I don't care about that. Well, if we go back to this, this slide, since it's the case, if we look at this for a second, everything is the same as it was before, except the case of applications or combinations. And combinations, I've got to do two things. One is I have to evaluate the procedure, I have to get the procedure by evaluating the operator. That's what you see right here. I have to make sure that that's current. That is not a delayed object. I have to evaluate that to the point where it became, it's forced now. And then I have to somehow apply that to the, to the operands. But I have to keep the environment, pass that environment along so that some of those operands I may have to delay, I have to, may I have to attach that environment to those operands. This is a rather complicated thing happening here. Looking at that in apply, apply, well, it has a, a primitive procedure thing just like before. But the compound one is a little more interesting. I have to evaluate the body just as before in an environment which is, which is the result of binding some formal parameters to arguments in the environment. That's true. The environment is the one that comes from the procedure now. It's a lexical language, statically bound. However, one thing I have to do is strip off the declarations to get the names of the variables. That's what this guy does, v names. And the other thing I have to do is process these declarations, deciding which of these operands that's the operands now, as opposed to the arguments, which of these operands to evaluate and which of them are to be, are to be encapsulated in delays of some sort. The other thing you see here is that when you have a primitive, a primitive like plus had better get at the real, the real operands. So here's a place where we're going to have to force them. And we're going to look what Evlist is going to have to do a bunch of forces. So we have two different kinds of evlist now. We have evlist and gevlist. Gevlist is going to wrap delays around some things and force others, or evaluate others. And this guy is going to do some, if it was some uh, forcing of things. Just looking at this a little bit, this is a game you must play for yourself, you know. It is not something that you're going to see all possible variations on an evaluator talking to me. And what you have to do is do this for yourself. And after you feel this, you play this a bit, you get to see all the possible design decisions and what they might mean and how they interact with each other. And so what languages might have in them and what are sort of consistent sets that make a legitimate language, whereas what things are complicated kludges that are just piles of junk. So Evlist, of course, over here, just as I said, is a list of operands which are going to be undelayed after evaluation. So these are going to be forced, whatever that's going to mean. And GEVLIST, which is the next thing, thank you, <clears throat> what we see here, um, well, there's a couple of possibilities. Either it's a normal, ordinary thing, a symbol sitting there, like the predicate in the unless. Okay, well, that's what we have here. In which case, this is intended to be evaluated in applicative order. And it's essentially just what we had before. It's mapping eval down, down the list. In other words, I'm evaluate the first expression and continue GF listing the cutter of the expression in the environment. However, it's possible that this is a name, a name parameter. 
if it's a name parameter, I want to put a delay in, which combines that expression, which I'm calling by name, with, in it, with, with the environment that's available at this time, and passing that as the parameter. And this is part of the mapping process that you see here. OK? The only other interesting place in this procedure, in this, in this interpreter, is cond. People tend to write this thing, and then they leave this one out. There's a place where you have to force. Conditionals have to know whether or not the answer is true or false. It's like a primitive. When you do a conditional, you have to force. Now, I'm not going to look at any more of this in any detail. It isn't very exciting. And what's left is, how do you make delays? Well, delays are data structures, which contain an expression and an environment and a type on them that says they're a thunk. That comes from algal language. And it's claimed to be the sound of something being pushed on a stack. Well, I don't know. I was not an algolition, so, or an algolite or whatever. So I don't know. But that's what it's claimed. And an undelay is something which will recursively undelay thunks until the thunk becomes something which isn't a thunk. Okay, and this is the way you implement a call by name like thing in Algol. And that's about all there is. Are there any questions? Uh, Jerry? Yes, Vesco. Uh, I noticed you avoided calling by name in the primitive procedures, and I was wondering what thoughts you have on that. You never need that? Yeah. Vesco is asking if it's ever reasonable to call a primitive procedure by name. And the answer is yes. <laughs> there is one particular case where it's reasonable, actually two. Construction of a data structure like cons, or making an array if you have arrays with any number of elements, okay, it's unnecessary to evaluate those arguments. All you need is promises to evaluate those arguments if you look at them. In other words, if I const together a two things, then I could const together the promises just as easily as I could const together the things. And it's only when I, it's not even when I car or could of them that I have to look at them. That just gets out the promises and passes them to somebody. That's why the lambda calculus definition, the Alonzo Church definition of car cutter and cons makes sense. It's because no work is done in car cutter and cons. It's just shuffling data. It's just rooting, if you will. However, the things that do have to look at data are things like plus, because they have to look at the bits that the numbers are made out of, unless they're lambda calculus numbers, which are funny. Okay? They have to look at the bits to do be able to crunch them together to do the add. Okay. So in fact, data constructors, data selectors, and in fact things that side effect data objects don't need to do, don't need to do any forcing in the laziest possible interpreters. On the other hand, predicates on data structures have to. If you want to say, is this a, is this a pair? Or is it a symbol? Well, you better find out. You've got to look at it then. Any other questions? Oh, well, I suppose it's time for a break. <laughs>